He was considered the best hitter of his time, maybe of anybody's time. But take the bat away, and his emotional compass often spun out of control. Alternately, shy and arrogant, generous and mean-spirited, sweet-tongued and blasphemous. He could kiss a baby one moment and soar into a towering rage the next. His career spanned four decades, and for much of it, Ted Williams entertained, whether he was swinging a bat or shooting from the hip at the press corps of an entire city. Here was a guy that the press did not particularly like, but was such a consummate baseball artist and was such a true warrior in just the ways that we tend to god up these heroes. And he was probably the realest hero that we've had. He didn't weasel out. He didn't change who he was. I am Teddy f***ing Ballgame. And you take it or leave it. Good afternoon, everybody. Kurt Gowdy, Fenway Park, Boston. Ted Williams' last game in a Red Sox uniform. It was a gray, gloomy day in Boston. It's sort of chilly. Cold permeated your body. The wind's coming off the Charles River there. They only had about 10 or 11,000. Williams in now. Jack Fisher. On the mound, one down, the first pitch to Williams. He swings and misses. I threw him a fastball that he swung and missed. It's the most mysterious swing and miss that I ever had because I don't know how I missed that ball. I said, he thinks he threw it by me. Well, I was going to, you know, go after him with everything I had and throw the ball as hard as I possibly could. Sure enough, he came back with the same damn thing, and I hit that just a little bit better. Here's the pitch, and there's a long drive to deep right center. It could be, it could be, it is! It's a home run! Ted Williams has homered in his last time at bat in a Red Sox uniform. And I wonder to myself, with this dramatic moment, I wonder if he'll finally break his bow and tip his cap. And what Ted told me was, you know, I was hoping so much to have a home run my last time at bat. I see it's there. I round first. And I'm thinking, should I? Home plate, they're waiting for him. He does not tip his cap. I was happy about the fact that I'd hit that one. And uh, might have given it a real little faint thought that that was it. He wanted to take a bow, but he also wanted to tell him to go to hell. I think Williams, in a vacuum, would have loved to have hit a baseball, regardless of fans, regardless of setting, regardless of adulation, regardless of money. That he received fame, money, and adulation is testament not so much to desire as need. Ted Williams needed to be great. He was a type A personality, but most great artists are type A. Ted's eccentricity was that everything had to be perfect as far as hitting was concerned. What happened when he took batting practice was unbelievable. I mean, it was thunderous. Nobody hit batting practice the way Williams hit batting practice. His intensity in batting practice was equal to his intensity during the ball game. I could see him, even now, grinding the bat in his two hands. It almost seemed as if there would be sawdust uh, on the dirt when he finished but when he was in there swinging it was a symphony a symphony by Brahms the brash rookie and the hardline Red Sox faithful seemed at first to be the perfect match and why not he led the majors with 145 runs batted in Right off the bat, he loved the fans his first year in Boston, 1939. He used to wave to them, signed autographs, did everything. And in those days, that first year, he not only tipped his hat, he would pick it up and he would raise it as high as he could. But in Ted's second season, peace and harmony changed with the suddenness of a fly ball to left. 
the stands in left field and Fenway are almost right on top of the left fielder. And one day a ball got by him, and Ted being a big gangly guy, he never did look like he was going full charge after a ball. And I don't think the fans thought that he was hustling as much as he should after the ball. And they booed him. Williams, who had rabbit ears, he could hear a boo out of 30,000 people. He knew right who booed him. And uh, he started getting mad and thought it was unfair. He says, I'll never tip my cap to those so-and-sos again. And, of course, headlines the next day, Ted Williams will not tip his cap to the fans again. And then they started booing him pretty good. From that moment until further notice, Ted was treated to unsparing coverage by the city's 11 newspapers. If he coughed, everyone from Beacon Hill to Back Bay knew about it. No one else can say the word writer the way Ted Williams can say it. It absolutely sounds like a four-letter word. He had a, a nonstop war with the, the Boston press and somebody put in the Boston paper. Ted Williams is such a fine person, he didn't visit his mother all winter. But Williams just rose to the bait. He was perfect. He was a Pavlovian experiment. Let's uh, ring the bell and see if the, the mutt comes out of the cage. And there he comes snarling out. They needle Ted uh, at times unmercifully. And I will say uh, on Ted's behalf that uh, he gave it back as best he could. Of course, uh, the only way he could do it was on the field. Well, he hit a home run. And when he came around, instead of touching home plate, he didn't just touch it and go. He jumped at it, and at the same time, he went at the uh, press box and take that, guys. Ted Williams made them eat more crow than they ever, ever ate in their life. Even in his finest moments, Ted could not bridle his disdain for the local writers. In return, the press sometimes denied him what he had clearly earned on the field. Twice he won the Triple Crown, and twice he was denied the MVP award. With an anger bordering on hatred, Williams fixed a murderous eye on one local columnist. We had a guy named Dave Egan who wrote the column in the, in the Boston Daily Record. He used to make Ted Williams so mad about stuff that he wrote. Well, this is Ted talking. He said, if somebody came through that green door right now and said, Dave, you're going to drop dead upstairs in the press box, he said, I'd look at that SOB and I'd say, good. <laughs> if he could have killed Egan and walked, he'd have killed him. While Ted fumed, his antagonist in the press box shed negative light on his personal life. When his draft status was changed early in World War II, they questioned his patriotism. When his daughter was born while he was off fishing, they implied he was a bad father. But on his turf, Ted was in control. He said, Mister, I can see you don't know very much about baseball if you're asking me about a bad year. Because old TSW, he don't have bad years. And you see those guys? And he pointed to the Boston sports writers. They do all give their left for me to have a bad year. But they'll keep their left because it ain't going to happen. His old TSW, he don't have a bad year. Womp, he throws the bat into the grass, bounces up, picks it up. He said, got enough. But the thing that has irritated me more over the years than anything else has been the fact that untruths written about me in the paper. And uh, it just irks me and irritates me so much that uh, I just explode at times and uh, possibly do things that I later wish I hadn't done. One morning, we're in Ocala where the Red Sox trained. He came to the breakfast table before we went to the park, upset about something. And towards the end, I reached for the check. He grabbed it out of my hands and let loose a string of expletives. And I sat there, I let him storm out. And I was so angered by it, and it made up my mind that I wasn't going to put up with it. I went out to the field where he was standing, got him aside, and I said, I want to tell you something. What you did this morning, I think, was inexcusable. You're not going to get away with that with me, period. So I went back to the motel. There was a knock on the door, and there's Ted with his head at a slight angle, he says, it's time to eat. Are you ready to eat? That was his way of excusing what he did and apologizing. Ted, like all of us, had a lot of faults. He was a very volatile guy. As a young player and on through his career, he was an angry young man. As I look back now, I realize how lucky I was that I was born and raised in San Diego, California. We had eight or 10 ballparks around there. I mean, nice little sandlot ballparks. 
plenty of room. And the weather was the best in the country. Born August 30th, 1918, Ted was the first of two boys. His father, Sam, was a professional photographer, and his mother, May, a passionate soldier of the Salvation Army. His father, he was an alcoholic, never home. And his mother was never home because she was totally devoted. She was the Salvation Army in San Diego. Ted and his brother would come home from school and the house would be locked. He wasn't even a latchkey kid. He, had, he was a front porch kid, sat out in the front porch until his mother got home. To look at Williams and to say he was a brat, that he was spoiled, that he was egocentric, sure, but all of that proceeds from his being extremely needy. But he was always kind of ashamed of what his mother was into. And his first memories and worst memories was standing in a street corner with his mother, and she is giving the Salvation Army pitch, and of course surrounded, mostly hooting, insulting people. I didn't want to be marching up the street, and uh, I didn't like that particularly, but I should have been proud to go up the line at that band banging and the cornet blowing and the drum beating, and I thought, oh boy. I didn't like that too, huh? You gotta go back to skulking behind the bass drum on the streets of San Diego. He was a very self-conscious individual. Slight, even the most innocent, really, really bothered Ted Williams. He told me that the first money that he ever earned in baseball, he was going to get his mother out of the Salvation Army. What he saw in her was obsession. She had the obsession for the Salvation Army, and it was for helping people. And he became obsessed with hitting. I don't think he, uh, he went to school to learn anything. He went to school to play baseball. Well, this kid came walking up the steps and said, hey, coach, let me hit. Well, the first ball he pitched to Ted went on top of that lunch armor in deep right field. The next ball, same place. Caldwell says, what's your name, kid? And he says, my name's Ted Williams. He says, I'll be here next week. When he was a kid in high school, he'd tell you that. And, and he wasn't just blowing smoke. He meant it. I want to be known as the greatest hitter that ever lived. I wanted to do that more than any other single thing in my life. I wanted to do that. And it was the most fun I ever had in my life. And it was the greatest accomplishment that I could do in my life. As kids, we every Friday when their high school team would play, well, we'd all go there. He was our Babe Ruth. He was just awesome. Now, if I didn't make it on a Friday to a game, I call one of my buddies, what Ted doing? He said, oh, you should have been there, right? He hit one of those eucalyptus trees out there. After hitting 430 over three seasons at Hoover High, Ted signed with the San Diego Padres of the Pacific Coast League for $150 a month. Weighing just 148 pounds, Williams worked for years to add bulk to his 6'3 frame. We go out after ball games and, and drink milkshakes to try to put on weight. And when he got through swinging, he would be all twisted up like a corkscrew. And then he would have to untwist himself. So he had a great, beautiful swing. Just to watch him, you know he had that good swing. And, and that's what attracted uh, Eddie Collins, our general manager. In 1938, Collins brought Williams to the Red Sox spring training camp. When the tryout was unsuccessful, Ted was sent down to Boston's top farm team, the Minneapolis Millers, where he behaved like a gifted but coddled brat. If he didn't feel like chasing a ball, he wouldn't chase a ball. And he was Eddie Collins' boy. And Eddie Collins sent word, leave him alone. And his manager called Collins one day and said, uh, you know, this is a, could be the greatest player I ever seen, but I can't stand him. Let me suspend him. Maybe it'll wake him up. Let me send him home. And Collins said, uh, the day Ted Williams doesn't put on a Minneapolis uniform, don't you put one on either. Despite his petulance toward management, Williams was quick to take advantage of the legendary talents of batting instructor Rogers Hornsby, who hit over 400 three times as a St. Louis Cardinal. Hornsby used to get on him all the time and say, Ted, you want to be a great hitter, you stay in a strike zone. And boy, Ted would not go out of that strike zone. 
He finished the season with 43 homers and the American Association's Triple Crown. But in a scenario that would become embarrassingly familiar in the majors, Williams was denied the MVP award. We thought that 1941 would be the last year that baseball would ever be played in the same manner that it had been played since the turn of the century. And in retrospect, nothing could be more accurate. While a nation teetered on the brink of massive change, two American leaguers illuminated the 1941 baseball season with feats so large, they seemed to keep the winds of war from blowing across a country still recovering from the Great Depression. 1941 could be called the last year of innocence in America. There was a war going on in Europe. There was a lot of effort in America to stay out of it. We were distracted by baseball, pleasantly distracted. Distracted by DiMaggio, distracted by Ted Williams. And it becomes a great way to hold on to an America that is about to slip away. God is in his heaven, baseball is still the great game, there are these exciting deeds, and you can turn to the sports page instead of the front page and get good news instead of bad news. That was maybe the greatest year baseball ever had. All the great players were still in the game. The season opened, next thing you know, DiMaggio hits his 20th in a row. On May 15th, Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams each began a hitting streak. While Ted's ended after a career-high 23 games, Joe continued his march straight into history. They were the two big guys, New York and Boston. Boston, New York. There was a little bit of a rivalry there. It wasn't that I was comparing myself to the Maggio in any way. If anybody was hitting better than me, I was looking right at him all the time in my mind. And the Maggio was hitting great all year. And anybody that happened to be doing better than I was, he was certainly a target of my mind. When he got close, uh, and we'd play at Fenway especially, where the scoreboard was there in left field, and Ted uh, being friendly with the scorekeeper out there, when Joe would get the base hit, he would yell over to me, Dummy, Dummy, what, Teddy? Joe got his hit. Although Ted was hitting 405 when he arrived in Detroit for the All-Star game, DiMaggio was the center of national focus. His streak stood at 48 games. But when Williams hit a game-winning home run, scoring DiMaggio, a nation's eyes turned toward the tall, lean kid from Boston. Hitting that home run in the All-Star game in the ninth inning was certainly a big thrill. The nation's entranced with DiMaggio's hitting streak, and he gets to 56 and it's over. Now suddenly they pick up the paper and they see a kid up in Boston hitting 400. Ted Williams, and the attention turns to Boston. 1941, Ted went over and said, Mr. Helrick, I want some 32-ounce bats. And I can remember Mr. Helrick throw his hands up in there. He says, Ted, you can't get good wood in 32-ounce bats. And this sounds like an exaggeration. But where he'd hit every ball would be right on the fat part of the bat, and that bat was all white, right in that one area. There wasn't a white spot out on the end of the bat or on the handle. My bats would have white spots all up and down the bat. He hated to be called a natural hitter. He said, what about all the work? What about the dedication? Nobody swung a bat more than me. Nobody thought about hitting more than me. On August 21st, Williams stood at 414. But after hitting only 354 in September, his average had dropped to .3996. To preserve what would be a 400 mark, Red Sox manager Joe Cronin offered to sit Ted out for the season-ending doubleheader in Philadelphia. And Williams said, Listen, I'm not going to hit 400 sitting in the dugout. As I got up the plate, Bill McGowan, one of the greatest umpires that ever umpired, he said, in order to hit 400, he said, you got to be loose. And Frankie Hayes, the catcher, said, Mr. Mack said, we're going to pitch to you today. I really felt like now I can see the light of day. Sure enough, bang, I hit 400. Williams went six for eight and finished the 1941 season with a 406 average. A guy batting 500 times and getting two earned hits. I just can't, I can't believe that could happen in the big leagues. All in the same season. 
The hitting streak of DiMaggio, 56 in a row. Ted's 406 batting average. Nobody's done it since. The question lingers down the long fall of years. Who was better in 41, Joe or Ted? I've been asked that question for about 45 years. And uh, I know it's uh, repetitious, but Ted is the greatest left-handed hitter I've ever seen, and Joe is the best right-handed hitter I've ever seen. Ted's bat was silent for five of the next 12 seasons, as he was called to serve in not one, but two wars. When he returned to baseball in 1946, Ted was so dominant at the plate that Cleveland manager Lou Boudreau devised a system to stop the pull-hitting lefty. When Boudreau put that shift on, everybody go over to the right side. They'd leave the left side of the infield open, they'd leave left field open, and every, the defense was all swung around to the right. I said, what the hell's going on here? Everybody's moving around, moving around, moving around. And it was so drastic, I said, what are they trying to do, make a joke out of this thing? It didn't do a darn bit of good because it didn't make any difference. The Ted hit the ball in the seats, he hit it between them, he hit those sinkers over the infield. That Boudreaux shift with a lot of publicity, there's a lot of hype about nothing. He doesn't say, well, why don't I just uh, kind of get it over the third baseman's head? No, I'm going to blast through them. Stubbornness is a virtue and a vice. And Ted had it in spades. That October, Boston played its first World Series in 28 years. Williams went 5 for 25, including a bunt as Boston lost to St. Louis in seven games. The Boston writers blamed the loss on Ted's lack of hitting. Some even claimed he choked. Over the years, the collar seemed to fit. I played poorly in the, in the World Series, and uh, certainly one of the reasons the Red Sox didn't win. And the criticism of him was made, it's probably sacrilege, that if the game was on the line, and there was a runner on second base, and the pitch was an eighth inch off the plate. Williams would not swing. He would take the walk, and the rally would die. In 1949, Williams won his second MVP award. But when the Red Sox blew a one-game lead with two to play to DiMaggio and the Yankees, Ted's detractors blamed him for Boston's failure. In his 19 seasons with the Red Sox, they finished behind the Yankees 17 times, winning just one pennant. Anytime you don't win the pennant, you've been close, has to be a disastrous year. And it, you'll forever live in that memory. On December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And the next day, the United States entered World War II. Williams, with a new contract worth $30,000, appealed his first to go 1A draft status on the basis that he was his divorced mother's sole support. They reconsidered all these uh, classifications. And his draft board made him 1A, which was a mistake. It was a mistake. He was qualified to, for the deferment. Williams was reclassified 3A, which meant that he would not be drafted until all those rated higher were called. Predictably, Williams was fried in the national press. Celebrated columnists Paul Gallico and Bill Corum questioned his patriotism. Even Boston owner Tom Yawkey urged Williams to enlist. He had set up a trust fund to take care of his mother. And his plan really was to uh, get the trust fund paid off and then he would enlist. Williams held fast despite losing a $4,000 endorsement deal with Quaker Oats. After a Triple Crown season in 1942, he reported for duty as a Marine pilot. I forgot about some of the bad thoughts, and I was getting gung-ho like the rest of them. He went to these classes in Amherst with mostly college graduates, and they had this Mathematics and physics, he always aced everything. Pesky was with him and struggling along. He was one of the brightest guys that I've ever known. He could do something, he could read something, and boy, he'd get it right away. He was so good at it, right out of flight school, they made him an instructor there at Pensacola. Late in the war, he was finally sent to Pearl Harbor to be attached 
actual combat unit. And he wasn't there a week when the war ended. He dropped the big bomb and that ended everything. And you know, he got out, we got out, we all went to spring training the next year and picked up to where we left off. But Ted had not seen the last of military life. In April of 1952, he was snatched back into the Marines and sent to Korea, where at 34, he saw extended combat. I got to know John Glenn. What a man. What a man. I was operations officer of the squadron, BMF 311, at Pohang K3 down in uh, southern Korea. We assigned a, a regular Marine and a reserve Marine to sort of fly together. So we flew together quite a lot, got to know each other very well. He was in there mixing it up, and he was an excellent pilot, very, very good. He got in John Glenn's squadron, and for the last half of their flights was his wingman. You don't pick a wingman because he can hit a baseball. You pick him because he can save your life. That kind of wonderful sense of continuum of Ted Williams and John Glenn, you know, wing to wing, flying into combat. In a sense, to me, it, it dwarfs anything that he ever did. February 16th, 1953. Williams was flying reconnaissance over North Korea when his F-9 Panther was hit. Now, there must have been about six or eight squadrons up there. And all of a sudden, we hear Mayday, Mayday. Well, then we found out there was Ted Williams. And then he pointed to my tail. Something was leaking. If the fuel pools in the bottom of the Panther, uh, it could easily catch on fire. And so you hear this squawking, I got you, I got you, I'm taking the Kempo. And about 3,500 feet, I gave him the gear down signal. The minute he hit the gear handle down, the wheel well doors came down and immediately the fire erupted right underneath the fuselage. So I call out over the radio, eject, 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 and they had a ejection sheet that was supposed to throw you clear. But I analyzed all the angles and everything, and I said, geez, if I have to eject, I said, I'll leave my kneecaps right in that cockpit. So I was terribly afraid to do it. He didn't know if he'd ever play big league ball again anyway. But he knew, by God, at that age, if he ever broke a kneecap or both of them, that really would be the end of it. He touched down at the end of that runway, and he skidded about 5,000, 5,500 feet. And the airplane came to a rest off the left side of the runway. All of a sudden, this big six-foot-four guy comes rolling out of that cockpit, and before you know it, he's 50 or 60 yards away. Why he didn't blow up, nobody knows because that's what usually happens, you know, the friction will just up you go. And he says, Kel, I think I was running as fast as Mantle to get away from that airplane. With Ted, he would say, you know, you're not a Marine until you've seen combat. I became a Marine. That summer, a ceasefire accord was signed, and Williams returned to Boston a war hero. From battlefield to ball field, the Williams legend was taking on a new shape and depth. Ted Williams is the John Wayne of sports. John Wayne didn't have, ever actually fight in a world war. I mean, he just did it in the movies. Jigsaw, commencing attack. Step by step, determined and unrelenting, the mighty force of the United States Marine Corps shakes the skies. I, I said to Ted Williams once, you know, you're the guy that John Wayne played in all those movies. He goes, yeah, I know. You're right. I know. You just can't bring yourself to point your finger at a guy and say, go get killed. I was so captivated by that swagger. I mean, this was the movie star. I mean to kill you in one minute, Ned, or see you hanged in Fort Smith. Ted Williams was what John Wayne would have liked us to think he was. Ted Williams was so big and handsome and laconic and direct and unafraid in that uniquely American cowboy way. That to me, he kind of epitomized the sense of the athlete as gunslinger. And I remember seeing him after he retired. He came walking down the hall and there he was in all of his glory, and I was not inclined to be blown away by just seeing him. And I thought, that is a true American sports god.
At the Jimmy Fund building in Boston, fame slugging star Ted Williams brings cheer to youngsters of the medical center, who are happy to see him back from Korea, where he served as a jet pilot. Let me tell you one thing about when he came back from Korea, even though it was batting practice, may have been the best thing I ever saw him do. He got into the batting cage, he hasn't seen the bat for 14 months, he hits one into the right field seats, hits the next pick, and the next pick, and the next. Williams is screaming at the top of his lungs, throw the effing ball, throw it! I'm looking at Williams, all of a sudden I see blood coming down his hands. I think it was nine or ten straight balls he hit out of the ballpark. In the four seasons that followed his Korean duty, Williams was plagued by a series of small, nagging injuries. To reduce things further, the Red Sox were never in contention. It got to the point where they had no chance and no hope, and he knew that. After losing the batting title by eight points to Mickey Mantle in 1956, Williams made sure he had no competition in 57. At 39, he led the majors with a 388 average. He was the only hitter I didn't know what to do with when I got two strikes on. The 388 at the age that Williams hit it is probably more amazing than the 406 when he was relatively a kid. I asked him once, wasn't that really greater than hitting 406? And he went, no. I was late on the low balls and I hit balls that year for half a season where I'd never hit them before in my career, but nobody caught up to me. So now that is a truly a great artist who can look himself in the mirror. I was down in the field and an usher came over to me and he says, Kurt, do you know a guy named Adolph Rupp? He says, he's over in the stand. I could, how are you? I said, gee, what are you doing here, coach? And he said, you know my hobby, Kurt, is to see the greatest. I've gone to Caruso, I've gone to the great actors and actresses in Broadway, I've seen the best and I, I want to see the greatest hitter that ever lived, Ted Williams. After Williams won his sixth batting title in 58, a painful neck injury the following season forced his average below 300 for the only time in his career. He vowed not to end his playing days on such an uncharacteristic note. He was making $125,000 a year. He went into Tom Yonke's office and said, I'm going to play one more year. But what I did last year was not Ted Williams. I didn't deserve what I got last year. I'm going to play one more year for $90,000. In 1960, Williams hit 316, then promptly retired at 42, with 521 homers, a 344 average, and the highest on base percentage of all time. I don't think any athlete in the history of sport in America has ever been mistreated by history as much as Ted was because of those five years that he lost. They, they would have been the prime years of Ted's life, without a doubt. For a man who's professed goal was to be regarded as the greatest hitter who ever lived. Had he hit 35 or 40 home runs per season in each of the seasons that he missed, you can see he'd be right up around Ruth's number. He would have scored more runs and driven in more runs than anyone else in baseball history. When he was inducted into Cooperstown in 1966, Williams raised the cause of players not only cheated by history, but denied altogether. And I hope that someday, the names of Satchel Page and Josh Gibson in some way can be added as a symbol of the great Negro players that are not here only because they were not given a chance. Three years later, Williams was lured back into baseball as manager of the cellar-dwelling Washington Senators. Although he lifted his team to 86 victories in 1969, Ted's four-year stint at the helm is remembered primarily for its rudderless ways. He was a great, great hitting teacher, but he was the most stubborn son of a I've ever seen in my life. He just didn't care about the rest, rest of the ball game. We'd lose. We had no meetings. We had no going over the mistakes we made. By the time sports writers got from upstairs, downstairs, to interview, he was gone. He had Denny McLean on his team, and they hated each other. And McLean and Elliot Maddox formed a society called the Underminers Club, which was dedicated to undermining Ted Williams' authority. He would stand up there when his pitcher made a mistake, and he'd scream, Pitchers are the dumbest people in the world, and I always do it. And you just proved it. I think one of the things that, that made him a failure as a manager was 
that he was so great that it was hard for him to accept anything less from his players. Century continues. A warm and fuzzy Teddy ball game makes peace with Boston and settles respectfully onto his throne as the greatest hitter that ever lived. Williams uh, had two, two great passions in life. One was hitting a baseball and the other was catching a fish. I wanted to fish with the best. And everybody tell me, if you can stand out there and watch Ted throw a fly, land it within a one-foot circle, uh, and throw it halfway across the world, uh, you'll be a better guy for that. You'll be a better fisherman. Williams became the representative for Sears Roebuck for fishing tackle. You're a spinner, huh? Yeah. Spin fisherman. Gee whiz, it'd be easier to fly fish in this stream, wouldn't it? Where With all it? these rocks, huh? Yeah, probably. Heck, and this is easy, too. Put that rod down a minute and come on out here and I'll show you how to do a roll cast. After baseball, Ted retired to Isla Morada in the Florida Keys, where he pursued his second love with the same intensity he brought to hitting a baseball. As an angler, Williams was so good that he was inducted into not one, but two fishing halls of fame. Ted was fishing for tarpon in the Florida Keys, his favorite place. He had a film crew there doing a special on his tarpon fishing abilities. A tarpon got on his line, and Ted realized it was going to jump into the boat. He says, this fish is going to jump in the boat. And sure enough, the fish comes into the boat, and Ted's grappling with this 125-pound fish. And when he finally gets it subdued and over the side, he turns to the crew on the other boat and says, did you get it? And they said, no, we ran out of film. He exploded, broke his rod, threw it into the water, cranked up his boat, and left. After three marriages, it became clear that Ted was not at ease with domesticity. But in later years, he developed a close bond with the youngest of his three children. John Henry has handled his father's personal affairs, marketed his name, and stood by him through a series of strokes. A lot of people, including Ted's close friends, give John Henry credit for being a protector of his father, for having his father's best interest at heart. John Henry, when he was 13, decided he wanted a relationship with his father, which after a while changed Ted's life. He fell in love with his son. Ted's love has extended beyond his immediate family. For more than 50 years, he has quietly contributed time and money to Boston's Jimmy Fund, a charity organization for children with cancer. 1993, my then eight-year-old daughter, Kate, uh, was diagnosed with leukemia. Within the first week or 10 days, um, the phone rang and uh, I was in the hospital with my daughter and Kate, who was sick, picked up the phone and she kind of withdraws the phone. She says, Dad, there's a loud guy on the phone here. You know, he's telling me I'm gonna be okay. She doesn't know who Ted Williams is. So I take the phone and he's got that booming voice. You know, I told your daughter, I talked to Dr. Farber 50 years ago and he told me he was gonna take care of those kids. I'm gonna come up and see her and he won't take any credit for it. He has raised millions for this cause over the years. In 1991, President George Bush presented Williams with the country's highest civilian honor, the Medal of Freedom. And when Joe DiMaggio passed in 1999, Williams became our most revered living baseball player. The fires of rage had flattened and cooled. All that remained was the essence of his greatness. When you're in Boston, probably only person that would command more presence than Ted Williams as the Pope. Please welcome the greatest hitter that ever lived, number nine, Ted Williams! Williams, a um, full circuit war with the media, with fans, with fame itself, really finished the circle there that night at the All-Star Game. My heart almost <laughs> almost dropped because uh, being in Boston where he played his career and the fact that he wanted me to be there, as it turns out, uh, to stand there next to him made it even better. Where is he? Right there. Oh, all right. Yeah. 
and the PA guy comes on and says, you know, got clear the field, get ready for the game, and guys are like, we, this is the best moment we've had in Major League Baseball. How can we clear the field now? Williams is the most competent man I've ever met in my life. He's the best fisherman I've ever fished with. He was the best jet pilot. He was the best hitter. Whatever he did, he went after it. He wanted to be not only good, but great at it. Ted Williams has aged and matured in a wonderful way. In many ways, he's matured in the same way that a great Bordeaux would. You know, it, it becomes well-balanced. It has depth. It's smooth. It's mellow. All those descriptions is what Williams has become. And they say the toughest thing in sport to do is to take a round bat and hit a round ball squarely. Ted Williams did that better than anyone who ever played the game. We study the numbers of great baseball careers, finding stretches of lost time, and wondering what if. For Ted Williams, what if looms large. Had not two wars stolen almost five seasons in the prime of his playing life, Williams would have soared well beyond 3,000 hits. And if he didn't actually break Ruth's record of 714 home runs, he would have passed the babe in total bases. Sweet compensation for a city that's been wondering what if ever since a certain pitcher was traded to the Yankees in 1920. For ESPN Classic Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler. His image burns bright in the memory of millions who yearned for a vanished America. His speed could blur your eye. His swing could skip your...